<laughs> okay. So, uh, thank you, thank you. So, Dr. Uh, Dr. Raji Ramareddy, I'm inviting him uh, to share his longest days. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Subendu. So, I'll be sharing some of my three longest cases. Uh, wait, no. Yeah, time is actually relative, the length. When you say longest cases, when you're operating, when you're doing own, your own uh, uh, unplanned complications of yours, every moment seems to be very long, drudging. So it is a, so these are the three cases where the actual duration may not be very long, but they were, I really felt each moment was uh, pretty long. It's a globe. First case is a globe perforation, then an expulsive hemorrhage, both in a macular hole case, and then an unusual blood clot. So this is a macular hole case. Uh, full thickness macular hole. Uh, this patient was taken up for surgery. The anesthesi anesthesiologist said that uh, uh, there was he had a problem while injecting and there was a lo lot of resistance. And I saw that probably he has done a, a globe perforation. I repeated the block and then went ahead with the uh, surgery. Yeah, this is how the surgery looks. You can see there is a there was a slightly uh, perforation at the near the vascular arcade, and uh, and then a little bit one more perforation slightly at the equator region the along the needle track. So as planned, uh, PVD induction was planned, and uh, and then along the lines of a routine macular hole surgery. After the induction, uh, you can see this clearly the extent of the retinal defect at the posterior uh, near the vascular arcades. And you also see that there is a peripheral small retinal detachment with the tear that is there in the periphery. So basically the needle, whatever is done, is there injured at three places, periphery, equator, and the posterior pole. So uh, it is already developed that intraoperatively was limited inferiorly. And uh, so that is a, so vitreous base dissection was done with indentation in this particular case. And then of course uh, some endo laser was done along the, for the two breaks in the, in the, near the arcades and the equator. There's one more that's there, the periphery that I plan to do under gas once it's settling the RD. So the inverted ILM peeling was done for this uh, case. And then fluid gas exchange. You can see that the, the other break in the extreme retinal periphery after fluid gas exchange, flattening that area. Some more render laser was done. <coughs> and then this is a break that is there that needs to be lasered under air. C3 effect gas was injected in this particular case because we didn't want to unnecessarily surprise the patient with some oil injection and then removal. Yeah. Yeah, this is how it looked on the first post-operative day. And then uh, the mac this is also on through gas, the macular hole had closed, and the patient did finally well after all this. The other case is of a 65-year-old lady who diminished within three months. She has been planned for a combined cataract and macular hole surgery. This was done five, five years back. So, yeah, there was an ingenuity demo that was going on while, while I was doing the surgery four years back. Cataract surgery was uneventful. And uh, suddenly, uh, PVD induction was done. After the induction of the PVD is when we notice a yeah this is when the start there is a yeah. 
see that there is a mound in the inferotemporal quadrant. It did, it did appear grayish. I was thinking it could be a retinal detachment and I was trying to look for a uh, causative break. As I was indenting and doing, looking for a causative break, uh, it, is, it was further increasing in the size and in injected PFCL to flatten the retina, thinking it was retinal detachment. But uh, it was, with the, along with, even with the PFCL, the mound it, which is increasing, that's when I realized it is not retinal detachment that we are dealing with, and it's an expulsive, probably expulsive uh, hemorrhage. So it, the, it was closed at this stage. Uh, with the PFCL inside, you can see the choroidal mounts kissing behind the uh, lens. Yeah. Uh, he was taken up for uh, resurgery after two weeks, this particular patient, and the remaining PFCL. We did do a 20 gauge ports to just to see if there is any other residual choroidal fluid that will drain through this residual PFCL that was there in the posterior pole uh, was removed. And inverted ILM peeling again was done for this case. Once again, retinal periphery was inspected to see where they, if there is any retinal detachment. Media was slightly hazy, but uh, we could achieve inverted ILM peeling. And then the case was closed with gas, SF6 gas. Yeah. And patient ultimately did well in this case. We have a four year follow up. Even provision improved to 2040. And this is, of course, last case where we find this uh, hypertensive patient with a vitreous hemorrhage that you see mostly inferiorly. Somebody else has diagnosed it could be branch retinal vein occlusion. And then he was taken off for surgery. You could see that there were. Layered, layered vitreous hemorrhage and uh, yeah. so PVD, PVD was induced in the rest of the quadrants but you see there is one localized hemorrhage in the inferior quadrant that was very densely adhered to the underlying retina mm -hmm. we didn't know uh, as soon as we tried to induce that detachment, uh, induce the PVD from there, we found that the retina underneath was tearing up. You can see there that the retina was started lifting it up. It's a very unusual, uh, strongly adhered blood clot. So, uh, so PFCL was injected this stage to probably help in, and uh, under air, the anterior extent of the vitreous blood clot was. Uh, removed and probably retina was detached at the anterior extent and retinal breaks were created in the extreme periphery while remove while cutting the anterior vitreous. This is all being done under air. Just to have a better view and uh, any bleeding that's happening, you can still have a good view. And this is under fluid now. You can see that the anterior breaks are there, but this blood clot that is very densely adhered to the retina was difficult to remove. You can see the ghost vessels behind, suggesting the BRV was the diagnosis. At this stage, we think I only have to think of doing some sort of a bimanual bi maneuver. I thought it's too difficult to grasp at this blood clot, so uh, retinectomy was planned for that area where that is densely adhered. And the uh, clot and the retina along with it. Retina had to be sacrificed to safely complete the case. This was followed by a fluid gas exchange and silicon oil in this particular case. This is our took first post operative. Thank you. Post uh, surgery, we did have to access the ultrasound in this space. We find that it was pretty localized uh, hemorrhage inferiorly that is very strongly adhered to the uh, uh, retina with. Uh, Thank you. You know, last case, what was the like reason for a strong attachment? Was it a polyp or angio? It's, it's a base case of BRVO. When you see lift the hemorrhage, you can see there's a polyp ghost was there. No polyp. It's basically branch retinal vein occlusion. Occlusion, with but a uh, lot of attachment was there. Yes, yes, probably. From the NVs. From the NVs. Mm, basically a large NV with a uh, uh, kind of a detachment. 
we do. So you have to avoid uh, undue traction while doing the peripheral, uh, and you're very careful yeah. in the peripheral attachments peripheral also. Attachments. And what was the like uh, uh, your uh, for after how long you did uh, this in your expulsive case? How long? You two weeks. Did two weeks. After two weeks. Two weeks we did the research. After that, the, all the expulsive all was subsided. Surprisingly, we did not know the composition of that because after five days when we see the choroidals was mostly, uh, it did resolve, the choroidals were resolved. So I did think it was not supracordial hemorrhage, it could be a choroidal detachment that progressed okay. so much and not yes, a hemorrhage. Because when you uh, took up the patient for the resurgery, the retina was absolutely yeah, yeah. Uh, looking healthy, healthy, healthy. just like uh, yeah. primary cases. So I, but uh, with the closed valves, I was wondering how is a choroidal detachment possible? There was nothing else. It's 68. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Thank you, Dr. Spender. Uh, yes, Dr. Dipender, please. Uh, challenge we uh, sometimes see is if it is can massive. Uh, you can use. Uh, massive supracoidal hemorrhage kissing choroidal and with its hemorrhagic choroidals. Now challenge is if you wait for two weeks, uh, the damage to uh, optic nerve head uh, due It'll to stretching more. of uh, vessels is uh, too bad. Uh, and yes. the damage is much more than what high IOP would le uh, uh, lead. So now off late in couple of cases, what I did was I went in inside uh, after one week itself yes. and did partial drainage. And you realize it will not completely drain at one week but at least 20-30% will drain and that kissing choroidal goes down. And I tell these patients, uh, we'll go come back again after another week. So at least their pressure comes down and they don't go into PL negative. So massive ones, you can go for two-staged intervention also. Because so sometimes you keep on waiting and then iridocorneal contact and they are so bad. By the time blood gets completely liquefied, eye is gone. Yes, so the, uh, the take-home should be yes. before seven days you should not intervene and bef and the best time is 7 to 14 days yes dr baiba yes 